Uh, we've got a couple of uh, really highly qualified speakers here in just a moment uh, on the use of mobile devices for investigations. Now I'm going to introduce, uh, I got to meet both of these fellas and I, I had dinner with uh, Adam last night and was just highly, highly impressed with his level of knowledge um, in, in this area. Adam what? Professor at John Jay College, uh, an assistant professor of public policy and a member of the full-time faculty um, Department of Public Management, John Jay College. Um, he is a member of the graduate faculty in uh, both the Master of Public Administration IG program and Master of Digital Forensics and Cybersecurity program at John Jay, researcher with John Jay's College Center for Cybercrime Studies. Uh, he's worked for and sponsored research for or in partnership with Sprint, Blackboard, Entourage, the FBI, Interpol, the UN, the U.S. Bureau of Justice, New York State Tax Reform, Fairness Commission, and, and on and on. Got really great credentials. Abraham Rivera has over 23 years of experience with computers, networking, information security, and digital forensics in the public and private sectors, including academia. Uh, former executive director of IT, uh, an investigative operations law enforcement officer for the city of New York, currently an investigator for a global financial services firm. Uh, again, two uh, highly knowledgeable and qualified uh, instructors today, so uh, please give a warm welcome to Abraham Rivera and Adam Wendt. Thank you, Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, <clears throat> Abraham and I are uh, very honored and pleased to be able to speak before the Association of Inspectors General today on a topic that we think is of critical importance because it's a fairly new topic and it's becoming more and more important. Uh, Abraham and I will split up our time about 20 minutes apiece. We'll save about 10 minutes for questions. However, if you have any questions during the presentation, if what we're talking about doesn't jive with your experiences, please raise your hand and we will identify you and uh, feel free to chime in at any time. Uh, in addition, we've taken this entire presentation. It's full of useful links and tips, and it is all online um, on my website. You can go to that website to download this entire presentation in PDF, including working links that will get you where we want you to go. Um, don't forget there's an X and a period before my name in order to get there. I have to start out by saying that nothing in this presentation should be construed as legal advice in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it's informational advice, and you need to check with your agency's attorney uh, before putting any of this into practice. So we're here to help impress upon you the need for what Abraham and I call a holistic view of mobile device forensics. And that's the best I could do for a holistic view graphic, sorry. A holistic view that takes the entire mobile device package archives, preserves, and prepares it, if necessary, for the investigation later on down the line. Because if information isn't properly preserved, according to the chain of evidence, if it's not accessed on time and in a way that could be helpful to law enforcement and prosecutors, suspects could get off. One of the best known examples of this in recent history, although not an IG case, is the Casey Anthony trial. After the Casey Anthony trial, after she was found not guilty, after she went home and smiled, lots of information came out about digital forensic evidence that was missed by the digital forensic experts. Had they found this information and folded it into the trial, I personally believe that there would have been a different outcome. Today, information is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. I'm looking out in the audience to people wearing Bluetooth headphones, playing on their smartphones, playing on their laptops. This information that you are putting into these devices, you are creating an archive, a diary of your life from moment to moment. And it's this archive or diary of your life that could be of use to investigators. The question is, is when and how could you get access to this stuff and what could you do with it after you get it? I want to impress upon you how important smartphones are today in society. Right now, in, uh, just at the end of the summer, nationwide, we hit 66% of Americans owning smartphones. That's about two-thirds of all Americans have a smartphone, and they use it regularly. 
That is a U.S.-wide statistic, but if we look at little microcosms, it gets a little bit different. For example, this number might not be of interest to you, but if we look at like a college community, John Jay College, for example, at this point we have 90% of college students using smartphones. Sitting, taking buses, entering their daily thoughts into their phone, whether it's on Facebook or text messages. Smartphone distribution. 53% of the phones being sold um, over the summer were Android. 40% were iOS, Apple products. And BlackBerry and Windows and other phones just equal 7%, a very small percentage. It is easy to start focusing attention on Android and iOS systems so that you can get a better idea of what people are doing with them. And, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm in New York City riding the bus or taking the subway, this is what I see. I see people sitting there using their phones every single moment. As a matter of fact, I often notice that it's rare not to see people using their phones. What are they doing with these phones? How savvy are they? What are they entering into it? If they just robbed a bank or they just committed a fraud, are they bragging about it to their friends or posting it up on their social networking sites? And if they are, how do you get access to it and use it against them at trial? Smartphone savviness differs with all of us. We have basic users, and there are many basic users in this room and around. And they just use these smartphones for phones, contacts, emails, and games. The email or the phone logs could put somebody in jail for a very long time. Average users use all those basic functions, but then they use heavy applications, third-party applications, or apps as we tend to call them these days. They use a lot of bandwidth, they use a lot of video, they spend the most money. Many of them could add second lines to their phone very easily. I was talking with one of our IGs last night about how this one iPhone has three different phone numbers. Three different, totally different phone numbers that work over three totally different protocols. And if you're only checking my Verizon number, you will see nothing. I never use it. You will think I walk around with the phone and never make a call or send a text message. The adept user, the phone is just an access device. I could throw away this phone and I'm perfectly happy carrying around a laptop. I could do everything from my laptop. But this phone has access to my digital world. And if you get access to my phone, access to my digital world, and if I'm a criminal committing frauds or crimes, what evidence could you get? This is not a simple topic. The law on this issue is not clear. If there's one thing that is clear to me, it's that all of us in this room have a constant struggle with the laws of mobile device investigations and digital forensic investigations. And the reason is quite simple. Many of our laws were written in the days of the landline, the days of the telephone. Much of the case law out there that tells us what we can and cannot do were written in the time of the telephone before cell phones, and today the laws are just as complicated, even the new laws. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the Stored Communications Act, the Patriot Act, Protect America Act, these are laws that were passed um, uniformly post 9-11, I believe, and they are laws that try to regulate and control a balance of people's privacy versus government homeland security or criminal investigations, but it's very, very difficult to find that balance especially in a Congress that doesn't seem to be too technologically adept. On top of that, we have this overwhelming third-party doctrine that is so rooted in case law, it goes back to medieval times. Third-party doctrine being that if you have a secret and you give it to a third party, it's no longer a secret. Those of you in the audience who are attorneys know that if you're interviewing a client and it needs to be confidential, the client can't have a friend in the room. Just the presence of that friend in the room can completely destroy your privilege. You could be forced to testify about that conversation. However, all of this device, all of my information here, is uploaded to third parties all the time. Dropbox, Evernote, Verizon, they all have my information. They're all third parties. Some of these situations are regulated by the Stored Communications Act, or the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. But many of them are not, so we're still trying to figure out what the third-party doctrine still means today. 
Is it antiquated? Is it still a good idea? I don't have an answer to that. We'll find out as time goes on. What is clear is that some of the traditional methods of obtaining information still apply. The single most important one, in my opinion, is consent. And the reason why I think it's so important is that for your community, for the inspector general community, very often you're dealing with government employees or contractors. Those government employees or contractors, more often employees, may have government issued phones and devices of which you have policies over that regulate them. There is more than enough legitimate case law and most of you know that if your internal policies make sure that your employees have no expectation of privacy on their mobile devices or, or their laptops or whatever, that they, you have a, a consent to go in and do a search. You don't need to notify them at times and it gives you a lot of power. User agreements, it's really important in user agreements and agencies that it very specifically states that there's no expectation of privacy and that the agency or, or government entity or, criminal or investigative services could go in and get anything at any time. We still have the ability for subpoenas and search warrants, of course, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And then, of course, we have plain view. If you're going into an office to seize computers and you see a printer, and oh yes, that printer has a hard drive, could you seize the printer, then get the warrant to take a look at it? A lot of those questions will depend on the jurisdiction that you're in. So it's not really a, an easy question to answer. What are your practices in your office, your IG office? A one-to-one -one image is the absolute best way to preserve digital evidence. For those of you who don't understand what a one-to-one -one image is, is it would be literally copying the flash memory in this phone bit by bit, preserving it at the time that you made the image. You're copying it in a way that changes nothing. Personally, and we'll talk about this in the next slide a little bit, I am an advocate of making one-to-one -one images incident to arrest as an inventory. And those of you with some evidence background know what I mean. When you arrest a suspect and take him, take him in for questioning, you inventory his personal belongings. You inventory his keys, his, his briefcase. Uh, I believe in most jurisdictions you can inventory even the trunk of his vehicle once impounded. But you're making a simple inventory of the information. You're not necessarily exploring it yet. So the advantages of making an immediate one-to-one -one image of that person's cell phone are many. It brings a very important question into play. Do you first arrest, then make a one-to-one -one image, then obtain a search warrant? Or do you take the safe view, safer view I should say, where you arrest, then get the search warrant, then get the image? Now it's important to remember that when we make an image, we don't have to look at it. So we could make an image to preserve it, then get the warrant in many jurisdictions to take a look at it. This might be making some of you uncomfortable, but there's something you might not realize. It is today, in 2013, getting extremely easy to remote wipe your phone. How many people here, just by a show of hands, the, the, the technology is really not streamed out there yet, but how many people have the ability to remote wipe their own phones, just by a show of hands? I mean, it's, it's about 15 to 20 percent of the room, at least. So you lock up your suspect, you bring him in, his brother has his password, logs into a website, wipes the phone completely. These are native functions today on every single iPhone. Every single person with an iPhone could do this easily. Android, you just need to install one application. Even worse, today, I've figured out a way to do a remote forensics wipe. Totally forensically wipe the drive including deleted information, including text messages. You're not recovering the stuff with end case. You're not recovering the stuff with the forensics investigation. It's gone from at least the phone. So since you could destroy the information almost instantly, do you have the legal justification, since it's destroyable, to obtain it and image it? There's some other techniques you need to know as well. And when Abraham takes over in a little bit, He's going to talk a little bit about a concept called Faraday bags. I'm not sure who has them. 
Faraday bags allow you to isolate the phone from the environment and cut off the signal. However, the second you take that phone out of the bag, that signal reconnects. The technology in these phones are incredible. Not even in, 19, in the book, 1984, was Oral able to dream up the types of things that we could do today. Not even in Star Trek. It's absolutely incredible. And I'm going to date myself a little bit with the next slide. Um, Zach Morris saved by the bell in high school with one of the first cell phones. That cell phone was a monster. It was a powerhouse. You wouldn't believe how much power that thing used. The reason why you can't use your phones in hospitals is because of that phone, not the phones we have today. That phone had so much power in it was able to knock out and mess with things. And that's what we started with. Today, what we have is far more sophisticated. And that's an understatement. This is a rip apart of the Samsung Galaxy S4. It is full of sensors, and it's no longer a phone. It is a computer. It's a computer with assisted GPS, a digital compass, Wi-Fi, cellular, LTE, Bluetooth, near-field communications, RFID, a three-axis gyroscope, accelerometer, proximity sensor, ambient light sensor, thermometer, barometer, dual high-definition cameras, and high-definition audio. It has a sensor array built into it that you, if you learn how, or criminals if they learn how, could take advantage of to in obtain intelligence and information. With those sensors, we can calculate so much. And, and the best part for you guys is much of the stuff that is calculated is preserved in the phone or at the service provider level for a very long period of time in some cases. We could calculate geolocation about around up to 30 feet. A history of where your suspect has been the entire time traveling around with them in the pocket. We could measure things like angular velocity, which direction they were traveling and how fast. We could try to figure out if they were running or walking at the time that you want to find out. We can determine pitch, raw, and yaw. Pitch, roll, and yaw. Rotation around gravity, six axis motion sensing. And we could tell so much about the environment and surroundings that you're in. I've coined this the Santa effect. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been good or bad. So get rid of your phone for goodness sake. <laughs> now, I'm not the first one to figure out we could take advantage of all this. Your app manufacturers figured it out long before I did. I guess that's why I'm here and not in Silicon Valley. But the good news is, is that we could kind of brainstorm with some of this. And, you know, I can't tell you all the possibilities. Here's an app. It's a running app. Turn it on, stick it in your pocket, go for a run. It runs in the background. You might forget to shut it off. It's constantly monitoring your GPS, Wi-Fi signals around you, gyroscope, accelerometer. And if your suspect uses this program and leaves it on, which is very possible, not only could you tell where he was, but you could tell where he was in a building with precision accuracy. You could tell if he was on the second floor, the third floor, what office he was in, perhaps. All by using these four sensors combined. It's absolutely incredible. We know when you're sleeping, there are sleep apps as well. And I guarantee you the majority of people in this room aren't used to use looking at third-party apps to be able to understand what's going on. But your suspects are leaving digital breadcrumbs all over the place. And it's up to you to be able to find them. Third-party apps are just one example. There are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of apps out there. These apps collect information on your suspects. These apps transmit information on your suspect to the app manufacturer. Luckily, the Wall Street Journal about a year ago put together a website. It might have been two years ago at this point. It's called What They Know Mobile. Let me see if I can log. Oops, I, nah, I'm not going to launch it. You can launch it out of the presentation. But what that website allows you to do is identify any application your suspect is running. And it tells you what information is transmitted to the app manufacturer so that you could know if it's worth subpoenaing that app manufacturer. 
Now, Apple and Google are constricting a little bit their privacy to give additional privacy to us. But there's still a treasure trove of information that you might not even know exists. How many of us have had to deal with this? Prepaid cell phones, dirty phones or burners. How do you know when your suspect has a second phone on them that's prepaid and not registered to them? Many of us deal with this every day, and it's in, it's in everyday media. I had to make a Breaking Bad reference in this presentation. And any of you who have watched Breaking Bad, or one of many other shows where there are criminals heavily involved, you know that there are lots of disposable cell phones around. Dating back to uh, popular media and The Sopranos, which I think is where it came out of at first, where most of us first saw it, criminals know this. They use this. They pick up these prepaid or these Go phones at Kmart or the 7-Eleven, and they use them to commit crimes. How do you know when they're using a disposable phone? How could you identify that? Enough. The importance to go through service providers when you have suspects. The amount of information you can get from a service provider is incredible. It's so incredible that the guides that they release on a regular basis, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, they release law enforcement guides, you guys have them. But what's so incredible about them is every new year, every new guide, the data retention policies seem to be increasing. At first, text messages were only kept for three days. Now certain providers are keeping them for three to five years. So if you want to go back and see what text messages your suspect sent a year ago, reach out to the service provider even before you pick up your suspect. If you need a warrant in that situation, get one and go and do it. And it's not just text messages. It's years of geolocation data. It's emails. It's IP addresses. It's another treasure trove of information that's there. And the best part about doing this at the service provider level is that your suspect won't even know what's going on. You don't have to lock them up, seize their equipment, and do an investigation that way. You could do it right through Verizon or AT&T. Okay, let me, um, I don't, I mentioned all this already, the types of things that we can get from the service provider. We can create and start identifying sophisticated networks of people who your suspect's talking to, who are they talking to. Social network analysis of an incredible scale all through the service provider. And as I mentioned, the service providers themselves have dedicated units to help you, dedicated units to help you get the information that you want. So to continue a little bit with the service provider information, I'm going to turn this over to Abraham Rivera. Um, and he's going to walk you through the service providers, and then some detailed forensics things that you might find interesting. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, one of the, I'm just going to go right into it. Um, in regards to uh, service providers, uh, a very good resource is the uh, International Association of Chief of Police uh, Center for Social Media. So they have a bunch of not only typical um, internet service provider uh, uh, carriers like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, but also all the uh, social networking and application social providers as well that a lot of us are familiar with in regards to like Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, eBay, um, I mean, you name it, Pinterest, you know, um, and a lot of how-to guides as well. Now, sometimes a new social networking app comes out and we're not, we're not too familiar with the app. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the Snapchat, uh, one of the ones that is fairly, it's fairly new that a lot of the, uh, the children are using it for, like, for sexting and, and everything else, uh, they have a how-to guide of how does Snapchat actually work. In addition to that, in addition to how it works, they also have a lot of references um, as far as how to go about obtaining uh, these uh, information from a legal perspective, from a legal authority perspective, uh, both uh, civilly and criminally as well. So uh, you can just take advantage of, of, of all this uh, plethora of information, and they try to update it um, on a regular basis as well. Uh, in addition to um, these uh, social media, there's also a lot of chat um, acronyms that actually uh, go out on a regular basis, uh, that spring up on a regular basis. And so you have like acronyms such as uh, or, or TCOB, right? Uh, taking care of business, 
uh, talk to you later, TTLY. We all know those, right? But what about, um, do you guys know what, uh, for example, um, let's see, uh, TWSS? That's what she said, right? We, we all like to say that, right? So. Uh, in addition to that, one of the things that uh, uh, Professor Want was uh, referencing was uh, cell towers. Now, the cell towers, for the most part, the proximity is about 10 square miles. Now, that's being very uh, generous in, in, in very ideal uh, conditions and situations. But the reality is when we talk about cities, uh, the cell towers are uh, anywhere between one to two square miles. Uh, that's one of the reasons why you might see these cell, cell towers on buildings. They actually look like, like large speakers. Uh, you see them on buildings, or maybe you're driving across the highway, you might see that. Now, there are some communities that don't like the, the, uh, the way the cell towers look. So they'll have uh, disguises for them. So they'll have them you know, looking like you know, cacti or, or water towers or you know, uh, church crucifixes or something, or they'll have them embedded in buildings or houses. You know, so um, uh, I have uh, included two references here uh, about cell towers. One is sort of giving you an overview of, of what a cell tower is, as well as all its components. And uh, that one in particular is called uh, withoutthecat.com. And withoutthecat.com has uh, all the breakdowns of like what's an antenna, the microwave dish, an amplifier, uh, the transceivers that are involved in the base station of a cell tower, uh, a router that connects to other cell towers, a remote monitoring uh, device, because uh, a lot of these uh, uh, cell towers are located in very remote sites. So there's, there's this constant uh, check to make sure that it is operational. And if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. You go to this website, you're going to see the breakdown of what each of these components are. Now, one way to, to remember without the cat, uh, it was said that uh, Albert Einstein, they asked Albert Einstein, what exactly is the wireless telegraph? And he said, well, if you squeeze the cat in New York, uh, the cat's tail in New York, you hear the meow in uh, California. Uh, the wireless telegraph is everything, is the same thing, but without the cat. Right? So that's one way to associate withoutthecat.com with uh, a cell tower. The other thing is, uh, uh, a lot of times we, we might get this, this, the uh, cell tower data from a service provider, but we need, to, we need additional reference points. So we can go to a website such as cellreception.com. Now there are quite a few of these websites that have this information, uh, I just chose one, and this one in particular is within uh, the New Orleans area. And there are about like 20-something uh, cell towers. Now, that's not to say is, the reality is there are actually more cell towers in this given area, but these are the cell towers that are either registered uh, with the uh, FCC or that the company uh, found out about. So the reality is because these lines, these cell towers are leased, uh, the service providers like AT&T, Verizon, Sprint do not necessarily have to disclose where these towers are. When we're dealing with evidence, uh, especially you know, mobile forensics, a lot of the times we have to make sure that we adhere to uh, evidence handling guidelines of the given agency in addition to adhering to its uh, chain of custody. Now when we talk about evidence handling of, of a device, there, there are many, many um, many levels we can discuss this, so such as the gathering of the evidence, uh, the transporting of the evidence, uh, if the phone is on or off, there are ways to treat this, this phone. If the phone happens to have uh, you know, fingerprints that we need to lift, or maybe some DNA evidence, we have to treat that di different than if we just took it from someone's house or we arrested uh, a subject and, um, and had to, to perform analysis. If we have to perform analysis uh, right there and then, or you know, immediately, or we had to, we can take it back, uh, you know, to the, to the computer forensic lab, do the analysis then, and then uh, worry about it later on uh, to to actually do the the um, the analysis and a reporting of this information. So just taking uh, taking it in the baby steps, we have acquired a cell phone. We got a cell phone on the scene. What do we do if it's on? Well, we want to, if it's on, we want to try to keep it on, but we want to put it in uh, what was uh, mentioned earlier, in a Faraday bag. Now, these Faraday bags shield all the, uh, the wireless communications to and from the phone. And uh, one, one of the ways to do that, these bags also have like a, a power cable, so you could 
potentially put the phone in the bag, power it, and, and make sure it has some sort of external uh, power battery before you take it back to um, you know, the lab for analysis. Now that's if a phone is on. If a phone is off, uh, normally you, you start the same exact way. You have the phone, you put it in the Faraday bag. If it just so happens that you have one of those phones that the battery um, is in the phone and you can remove the battery, you want to remove the battery first. Now there are some instances where a phone could automatically turn itself on. Now in doing that, um, the possibility still lies some remote wipe has been initiated. And maybe the, the remote wipe was initiated a few days ago and you just picked up this phone that's off. You know, so you always want to treat even a phone that's off, you always treat it as if it was on. You want to place it in this uh, Faraday bag because as soon as you turn it on, just like when we turn on our phones, like early in the morning or if, if we turn off our phones at night, the first thing we get hit with are text messages, you know, voicemails, you know, um, and, and everything else, you know, emails that we get to our phones immediately. So the same way we can get those types of items is the same way we can get the, uh, the remote wipe initiated. And if that happens, uh, normally uh, analysis is, uh, is, is almost impossible. And you know, I'll get to that in a little while when, when we discuss uh, levels of, the, um, uh, of extraction uh, using a, a pyramid uh, paradigm. Just so you can see what it looks like, there are Faraday bags that are like duffel bags. If we have a whole bunch of uh, mobile devices, uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, a cell phone, right? It can be an, an iPad, an, an iPod. It can be a laptop with wireless communications. Uh, there's also these, uh, what's it, these, they're normally referenced as uh, uh, a Faraday box or a Faraday cage. And now they, they come up with a, what's, what's known as a Faraday tent. So it's just basically mesh, uh, mesh shielding that you put your, your hands through and you can actually perform an, an analysis through the shielding guaranteeing that no signals are um, coming into the tent and no, and no signals are exiting this, uh, this tent. Now the uh, per, uh, pyramid levels of uh, examination, this is one concept that I'd like to, uh, to get into with you guys. Uh, referencing the bottom piece is the easiest and as you climb higher in the pyramid, uh, the levels of extraction become that much more difficult. So for example, a manual um, extraction would literally be looking at your phone and sifting through your phone. So if you had a phone and you found a phone on the scene and you want to see, well, you know what, what was the last number that was dialed, right? We see this all the time. That's considered a manual extraction. You're still doing something to the phone. So by, uh, let me see what was the, the appointments he had or whatever. So you go into the calendar application on your phone. That's manual extraction. Then we get into uh, logical extraction, which I have a, a, uh, one slide to show you all the, um, uh, the items, but a logical extraction is you're, you're taking on, not only the active files, in traditional forensics, when we talk about a logical acquisition, we, what we're referring to is the active files, the files that are actually used on a regular basis. So when we talk about mobile forensics, uh, a logical extraction is, for example, uh, backing up your, your iPhone and now looking at iTunes or some respective uh, data backup for your, for your phone, whether you're using a Blackberry or an Android, and looking at that application and seeing all the entries in it, seeing all the, the voicemails, the calendar entries, the, uh, uh, the contact list. You know, so that's what's considered logical um, extraction. Then we get file system extraction, where file system includes everything that the logical has, but also includes additional files that primarily could have information that was marked for deletion that wasn't formally deleted. So for, for example, you can have information such as text messages that were marked for deletion that do not come up in your logical um, examination, but do come up in the file system examination. Uh, the same goes for um, history. Most of our phones contain where we've connected to uh, in regards to Wi-Fi. We've come to this, to this hotel, we connect to the hotel's Wi-Fi. We go into the, one of the other conference rooms, we connect to that particular Wi-Fi, which actually utilizes a different code, right? If, if for those of you who were in the other rooms, you may have to put in different codes than you were in the room. Well, all that information, that historical information, is found in the file system uh, level of, of extraction. Then you get the physical level of extraction, which is the most detailed. It's the one that most people, or most investigators especially, would want to have. And this includes all the 
deleted information. So stuff that was deleted is part of this physical extraction. It's that bit by bit copy that, that was referenced in, uh, in, er in the um, earlier. A chip off, I, I just mentioned it here, chip off, sometimes we may not have the ability to, to plug in a phone for whatever reason. Maybe the phone was destroyed. Maybe someone you know, knocked it with a hammer. Or maybe you actually have a phone that doesn't have a typical um, uh, output to uh, be powered. Maybe you have a, a USB recording device that does not have a USB um, uh, input. So in that respect, you would, you would use a chip off technique, and which is why it's the top of the, uh, the pyramid and also the most difficult, where you actually extract the chip um, have, you have to have a special chip reader for it, and then it will dump the data, and, and a, which was known as a hex dump. And very painful, but painstakingly, you can actually extract the information or the memory that was on that chip. So, again, logical in regards to the data types, call logs, contacts, uh, SMS messages, videos, audio, music. File system, its data types now contain additional information such as Bluetooth, um, historical information, Bluetooth, GPS, um, and very specific application type of information. If you use, you know, Skype, if you use Google Voice, or any other type of third-party applications on the device, you'll see this information within the, uh, the file system. And the physical extraction gives you the most detail, the, uh, the most information, but the most important part of the information that, that you'll get with physical that you don't get with the others is the deleted content. And that's what Mobile forensics wants to be, it wants to be at this point, but the reality is because all these, uh, most of these phones use, uh, use uh, uh, flash memory, it makes it that much more difficult to obtain this um, uh, unallocated space or this unallocated memory that when something's deleted, almost it's very difficult to uh, retrieve this information. So mobile forensics is not there yet in regards to being able to undelete all um, data, especially if you have various phones that do have encryption uh, built into it. It makes it that much more difficult. So a lot of times we have to rely on the uh, file system extraction. And uh, the reality is physical is the most difficult. Uh, most likely the product will be a costly uh, forensic product that you're going to get, whether it's a software or hardware based uh, forensic tool that's used. And all the various uh, data types that, that can be extracted with, the, with the, uh, the levels of examination. Now, certain limitations um, exist in phones, right? One I mentioned was the ability to, to do an actual bit-by-bit -bit, um, physical extraction of a phone. Now, it makes it difficult because not all phones can be physically extracted. There are a lot of companies that may claim that they can do it, but then um, the reality is it really doesn't work as well, so you have to go down a level, in this case, either the file system or the logical level on an active file um, uh, level when we're looking at the, uh, the pyramids, the logical. When, when we talk about seizing evidence, uh, one of the things to keep in mind is on a phone itself, phones also have external memory cards. Now, if they're external memory cards, we have to treat those external memory cards as if we were doing a computer acquisition or any type of a uh, hard drive acquisition. In that case, those can be uh, recorded as, excuse me, acquired um, as physical extraction, where if stuff was deleted on that card, there is a possibility to undelete information from the card itself. And a lot of times, a lot of us use these cards to store our videos, our audio, you know, as well as our pictures. And sometimes that's where, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of good information, a lot of good data um, exists. When we, um, in regards to preparing uh, equipment, when we're doing analysis, we have to make sure that the hardware and software that we use is, in fact, um, accurate and it, it's, it can be validated. And it's very important that you don't want to only use or rely on one uh, typical application, whether software or hardware based. You should have a combination of, of the two. Uh, and most of my uh, career in uh, civil service and as well as private, we have multiple um, applications, hardware and software, and we validate one with the other. Um, aside from this validation, we also have the, um, uh, the, the need to do a peer review, some sort of QA quality uh, uh, assurance to make sure that once I've performed some examination, uh, which, which includes the acquisition 
of the extraction, the analysis, uh, as well as the reporting that I have my peers, I have two other, uh, at least two others, QAing my work to make sure that the methods and the procedures I followed also, um, you know, are, are the way, it's, it's repeatable. And, and if they look at this information, if they can repeat, the, uh, if they can repeat it, then um, it passes QA and now it gets, it gets sent, sent out to legal or for that matter, maybe prepared, um, prepared for some sort of court report. Um, as far as most products, I just, I just wanted to give you some numbers. Uh, these are the more popular forensics that are used in, 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 in public and corporate. Uh, NCASE Neutrino is $5,000. I have an asterisk next to it. Uh, again, depending on whether it's public or private, uh, NCASE also, it, it includes Neutrino within the package itself. So you already have Neutrino if you, have, if you bought NCASE, which is by, by guidance software. Then there's um, Access Data which is uh, 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 Data MPE Plus, that's about 5,000 also. Uh, Celebrite UFRED, UF, UFRED is one of the more popular um, mobile forensic devices. And being the most popular also means the more, uh, the more costly, right? So uh, that one's uh, 10.5. And then there's Lantern 3, which is $600, and then Oxygen Forensics. Um, I just want to show you what it looks like from uh, a, uh, an investigator's or examiner's perspective when you actually image something. So, uh, in this case, I use the, uh, the, the, the least expensive product, but it's also very, this is actually a very good product, and it parses the data very nicely. Now, this was a file system extract, not a physical, a file system, and this was done on, a, um, on an iPhone um, 5, with, actually, an uh, iPhone 4S, which had encryption built into it. And as you can see, you can get everything from uh, not only the notes, the messages, images, videos, the dictionary. Have you ever typed, sent text messages to someone and... Your, your words get pre-populated automatically, right? That gets, that gets stored in a dictionary. That's a breadcrumb. That actually gets it. So if you're constantly saying typical phrases or, or something like that, that will be included in this, uh, uh, in this examination or for that matter, in this report. So you get all your calls information. How many times you called it? What's the duration, the date and time? Uh, voicemail, you can actually listen to the voicemail messages that are stored on this phone. So we're not even going on to the service provider and, and requesting and having to do a search warrant to actually be able to listen in on the other voicemails. We can actually do this uh, in regards to what's stored in that phone. Um, messages, text messages, how many messages overall, what's the hash value, what's, what's the integrity of these messages. And also the location of the messages within the file system. Wi-Fi history. Breadcrumbs, geotagging, right? We've, have you ever guys ever taken a picture and then you have the GPS information behind it and maybe not know that, oh, that, that you had the geotagging enabled? Someone at a bar taking a picture uh, can pinpoint exactly where you're at. Well, all this information, you can take the, um, the actual picture, look at it, get the geotagging information, click on a link which automatically ports it to Google Earth or maybe has its own interface and gives you the exact location of what it looks like, how Google Earth has it, you know, um, uh, in, in relation to the picture. So you can match the pictures based on the location. And this is just another, applica uh, another forensic, um, this is actually using a, a physical analyzer, which is a Celebrite UFED. And we list uh, various resources, um, or everything I've spoken about, um, can be found in these resources as well, and we'll also include additional uh, guides on the, uh, on the website. So uh, thank you. And we're going to do some, uh, we'll take some questions now.